So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tom. Um, so Tom um, is a professional conservationist working for the Yellowstone Island Open Land Trust, so right across St. Helena Sound from us. Um, you know, it's funny, it's, it's, it's was what, a two hour drive here of us from Edisto? It's an hour and a half from Edisto. You know, hour and a half, it's a, it's a 15 minute boat ride, you know? <laughs> and that's, that's all it is. Um, so, uh, but um, he's an independent researcher, an avid naturalist from the Ace Basin of South Carolina, um, and through Edisto Island Open Land Trust Hutchinson's house project on Edisto Island, uh, a reconstruction era Friedman home. Um, which is being restored and developed into a public green space. Um, Thomas found himself amidst an effort to study, interpret, and reintroduce one of the state's most influential cash crops, the Island Cup. Um, and I'm going to do a quick plug. Um, I know Tom, how I convinced him is we oftentimes uh, partake in SC Park outings together. Um, last time I actually ran into him, you were eating some Smilax, and yeah. um, you were on a mission to try all the Smilaxes in the region. I wanted um, to see if I could identify them by taste. <laughs> I can't, but they're, it's worth they're the effort. Very, they're, they're, there are very many species, and a lot of them are very similar, so that's hilarious. Uh, I thought that was wonderful. Uh, and after that, I was like, all right, I gotta get you to come do a talk for me right now. Uh, but, uh, so Tom is, is truly an amazing naturalist, so um, a wealth of knowledge. Um, I'd also like to give this to you, which is an honorarium. Um, we are able through grants to give honorariums to all of our speakers that are willing to accept them. Um, I've had some speakers say, no, I can't accept those on behalf of their organizations or whatever have you. Um, so, but luckily we can support um, all of our speakers in that Come. capacity. Convinces my boss to let me drive down here and yeah. spend half a day oh. rambling. So. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, it didn't take much convincing for him to do it, but yes, the higher up. So without further ado, Tom Austin. Thank you very much, Chris. All right, so here today I'm here to talk to you about resurrecting Sea Island cotton. Um, and so just real brief, if I remember to turn the pointer on, um, I wanted to give you all some background information. So and just as a as a Quick little thing uh, before I get into this. There's a lot of words on these slides, and I'm probably going to read most of them, and that's not because I can't remember it, it's because I will end up three hours down a tangent if I don't follow the slides. <laughs> so they're up there for y'all as much as they are for me. Um, but I, first I need to give y'all some background information on not just uh, Sea Island Cotton, but also the Hutchinson House, as well as the Edisto Island Open Land as Chris said, my name is Tom Austin. I have a bachelor's in wildlife and fisheries biology from Clemson in 20, or 2016. I'm a professional conservationist and ecologist. I work for the Edison Island Open Land Trust as their land protection specialist, so I do all things land conservation as well as ecology, stewardship, property management. We're a small nonprofit, so I wear a lot of hats. So a lot of y'all here know that how that goes. Um, I'm an expert naturalist. I'm on the board of the South Carolina Association of Naturalists, and I'm the vice president of the Carolina Butterfly Society. I'm an independent research. I'm a hopefully soon to be author if I can find a reasonable publisher for my book. Um, I'm an 11th generation Edistonian and I'm a man of esoteric interests and eclectic hobbies, which is what brings me here today. And I put all this up here, not to brag, but because as, as you saw on that prior list, I'm not a historian, I'm not a farmer, and I'm not a horticulturalist. I am learning as I go through this process. So some of y'all here in the audience today may be better versed at some of these subjects than I am. Um, I'm learning all this stuff as I go along, so I have invariably gotten something wrong somewhere along the way, so if I have, please let me know. Um, please leave a scathing review and, and remind me where I've gone wrong. That's how you learn, is uh, to be publicly embarrassed. Um, so that's why I'm putting myself out here. And again, take everything I say with a fistful of salt, because I'm not a historian, I'm not a horticulturalist, so I don't have a background in these kind of things. I've just kind of found myself in this position. Um, additionally, the story of Sea Island Cotton by Dr. Richard Porche is kind of the, the basis, the backbone, the scaffold for all, all the research and a lot of what I'm presenting here today. Um, that is a phenomenal work. Um, it, is, it is a borderline treatise on the subject of Sea Island Cotton here in the Low Country. So if you're interested in kind of the deeper minutia of Sea Island Cotton, its cultivation, its production in South Carolina, pick up a copy of the book and read it cover to cover. It's, it's a fantastic tome. Um, additionally, I have also pulled in information from other primary and secondary sources as well. And like any good historian, I have not cited any of them in this PowerPoint. So. <laughs> um, and real quick on the Edisto Island Open Land Trust, we are Edisto Island's local land trust. We cover the whole of Edisto Island, all 42,000 acres of it, as well as um, the Megat, Hollywood, Ravenel, Adams Run, Parker's Ferry area. Pretty much everything between the South Edisto, the Dorchester County line, um, Rantoul's Creek flowing into the Stono down to the North Edisto in the Atlantic Ocean. It's about a 200 square mile area that we work. We're one of the few 
um, local land trusts operating in the state, and we are hyper-focused on protecting Edisto Island. And our mission, which I still have not managed to remember in seven years, is to preserve the rural quality of life on Edisto by protecting our lands, waterways, scenic vistas, and heritage through conservation and education. And, and we have various projects and other activity, or and, um, projects and conservation initiatives on the island that hit every one of those things. Uh, but the primary thing that we do is we help landowners conserve land through voluntary conservation easements and through education. Um, and so that's the core of what I do at the Land Trust, is I help get new land underneath conserva or voluntary conservation restrictions. I find local landowners who want to preserve something special and integral about the land they own, and I help them get or voluntarily place conservation restrictions on them that are held by the Land Trust that allows that property to be preserved and conserved forever in perpetuity. And the Land Trust is there to steward that land forever going forward. In addition to all that, we also have several community conservation programs, which are um, projects that balance conservation needs as well as the needs of our community, our cultural needs, our, our just infrastructure, that kind of thing. It's kind of blending conservation with, act, with community progress. And within that, um, one of those projects is the Hutchinson House. This is in 18, circa 1885. We don't have any concrete records that say it was built exactly in 1885, but that's the number that's been floating around for decades. The house was built circa 1885 by Henry Hutchinson. And that land was purchased by his father James in 1875. Uh, the, the building was added to the historic register in 1987, and the Edison Island Open Land Trust purchased it off the open market in 2016 in order to preserve it. Up until that point, from 1875 to 2016, the house was owned in continual ownership by the Hutchinson family. And it just so happened that one of the last family members just decided it was time to sell off the property. They hadn't been able to organize and, and get a preservation um, effort going. And thankfully, we were able to step in, fundraise, purchase the house, and get it and start this process going. Um, um, we've been working with the family hand in hand the entire way through. Um, we purchased the additional lot, uh, an adjacent lot next to it. So a total of 18 acres surrounding the house in 2019. Uh, and right now, the house is in the middle of restoration. Um, I used the laser, but it doesn't work. Um, but up here at the top, this is the configuration we're planning to restore the house back to. That is the house circa 1900. Um, and down here at the very bottom, these last two photos, that's currently what the house looks like. And we have just got um, the initial site plan review through Charleston County, and now we're working on building permits. It only took us seven months to get the initial permits, but eventually we'll be able to spend all this money we've got sitting there to finish restoring the house. Um, but eventually the house is going to be restored back to its original 1900s configuration, and we're going to open up the property. Hopefully the house will become sort of an open air, empty museum, mm -hmm. kind of like how Drayton Hall is, where there's nothing really in the house, but people can come through and tour it. We may even be able to get some of the artifacts from the family to display on the inside of the house. And then the property itself will be a green space that will interpret the history of the family, the history of the land, the history of Sea Island Cotton, as well as environmental education and other you know, well, I have a pollinator garden out there, as well as bat box and bluebird boxes, that kind of stuff. So we'll be able to, to unify environmental education as well as with the, um, with the historical interpretation of the house itself. Um, so um, the, the Land Trust just kind of found ourselves amidst working on this project because there was a need, the house is on the market, something had to be done or the house was going to be bulldozed and something was going to put in its place. And so we stepped up and somehow we've ended up um, spearheading this project and this, I just have to say, this project has been miraculous from start to finish. Well, we're not even done yet, but every time we have encountered a problem with this project, we have something just sort of coincidentally has come out of the blue to fix that. You know, we've been able to raise all of this money through various grants and private donations in order to buy the property and get the house developed. And so it's, there, it just, it's, it's uncanny how many, how many, how many, um, small facets of this project or, or you know, stumbling blocks that we thought we would never be able to hurdle just seemingly evaporated overnight as we've been working on it. And this, the Sea Island Cotton Project is one of those small pieces of this much grander project that we're working on. Um, just real quick, I need to give you some context on the Hutchinson family. So up here on the left, we have James Hutchinson, to the right, his son, Henry Hutchinson. Below that, we have Henry and his wife, Rosa, and as well as their two daughters, Lula Whaley and um, Mabel Bernard. Um, James Hutchinson was a Civil War veteran. He was in the Union Navy. He helped, um, he um, reported the position of nine Confederate spies in, I believe, 1862, or it might have been 63, don't quote me on dates throughout this thing. Um, 
Uh, joined, or, and he actually, it actually led to the capture of his half-brother, Townsend Michael. Um, uh, James Hutchinson was an illegitimate son of Isaac Jenkins Michael, the owner of Peter's Point Plantation, and he actually was able to get his half-brother, Townsend Michael, captured. Um, and that was the impetus for him then joining the Union Navy and coming back a war hero afterwards. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, he became a Sea Island cotton farmer. He was a social activist. He was an local, uh, influential local politician, uh, as well as a business entrepreneur. He founded the first black-owned steamboat company on Edisto Island. And Edisto Island at that time, up until about 1920, had no landward access other than a swing bridge going across Watts Cut, which is now the Intracoastal Waterway. And you used to have to take, used to have, you could only take small cargo across this one swing bridge and go all the way through Jahasi Island and up around through Spring Grove and back through Adamstron if you wanted to get um, to Charleston Harbor. So the most efficient way on and off the island and the only way to move goods and cargo was through, um, was by boat up the Stono River to Charleston Harbor. So he founded a steamboat company uh, in the, I believe the 1870s, maybe the early 1880s. Um, and so he, he was a, an influential and successful businessman, politician, and social, act, social activist on Edisto Island. He also organized at least two freedmen land co-ops that we know of, which is where um, he would get several freedmen to all pool their funds together, and then they would buy an entire plantation that was on foreclosure, and then they would divide that property based off of their proportionate interest in the actual purchase. So with this, they were able to pool their funds and buy a property that they normally would not be able to afford, and then they would be able to get these 10, 15, 20 acre tracts of land at a steep discount because they were able to buy the land at bulk. So he was able to do at least two of these, one along um, Eggingsville Beach Road, uh, on the old Seaside Plantation, and the other one was the old Clark Plantation, which is where the Hutchinson House was eventually built. Uh, however, Jim was shot and killed on the 4th of July in 1885 by a white man from Wadmala. Um, his son, Henry Hutchinson, uh, built the Hutchinson House and farmed the land surrounding it. Um, he built the house about the same time that his father was shot. We don't know whether he started the house before or after his father was killed. Um, but we know that it was at least started or potentially finished about 1885. Um, Henry um, ran a, um, an agricultural co-op. Um, he owned and operated a cotton gin uh, on his property that was able to um, process, package, and ship all of the cotton that was produced by his neighbors in the surrounding Clark community. Um, and then he was able to um, pack that cotton and ship, ship it directly to market. And because he was uh, collecting and processing this cotton from probably a dozen or two different small farmers around the area, they were then able to sell in bulk directly to a factor in Charleston who acted kind of as a lender and a broker or for cotton farmers in the time. So they were able to avoid all of the middlemen, all, all of the, the discounted um, rates that they would have to face selling to local middlemen um, and deal with the factor. So they could get much better rates on their cotton and because they were, they were processing this in bulk, they could grade it. So it wasn't just you know, if you were a small farmer working 10 acres, you might make two or three bag, two or three bales of cotton a year. You just had to put all the cotton in one bag. But because they were processing in bulk, they could grade it between low quality, medium quality, fine, and extra fine cotton. So they were able to get even higher prices at market because of this. And additionally, because he was working directly with the factor, he could get loans, or he could get larger loans at a, at a lower interest rate, and then distribute this amongst people. So he was able to help elevate his community and uh, help folks all throughout the Clark community um, find financial success, success growing Sea Island cotton by running this co-op. Um, uh, additionally, uh, his two daughters, Lula Whaley and Mabel Bernard, were both lifelong school teachers on Edisto Island. Lula's actually taught, she taught, um, it's, hard, it's hard to tell what, what actual grades they would have taught, the equivalents would have been, but she's taught school on Edisto Island for 55 years straight. So she taught at least two, if not three, solid generations of Edistonians on Edisto Island. Um, uh, both James and Henry were big on their children getting educations, as well as um, the, the Freeman and African American communities that followed being educated, knowing what they were doing, and you know, owning their own land. That was a big thing James pushed for. Um, just recently, actually just a few months ago, uh, the, Hut the Hutchinson family has founded the Hutchinson Heritage Foundation, their logo down here. Um, which is their collective effort to preserve their collective history uh, on it, or their collective history on Edisto Island and off Edisto Island. Um, and so we're, like I said, we've been working with the Hutchinson family um, on the Hutchinson House project this, all the way throughout it. And so this is now their, their first um, formal push to um, um, sort of 
collectively all work towards the same interpretive goal alongside us, um, formally through this new nonprofit. So the, Hutchinson, the story of the Hutchinson House and the story of Sea Island Cotton are thoroughly intertwined. Um, sea Island Cotton is one of the most significant plants in the history of South Carolina. Uh, its profitability as a cash crop, crop uh, fueled the plantation economy and set the stage for the Civil War in the Charleston area. Um, it, sea Island Cotton was also grown, this is something a lot of folks don't think about, it was grown for over 150 years in the low country of South Carolina. Most folks only ever think about the first half of its history, which is from about 1790 to 1865, which is when it was grown underneath um, the, the plantation economy in the, the plantation system. But the second half of its story is what the Edison Island Open Land Trust is seeking to interpret surrounding the Hutchinson House, because that's when this plant was most significant to the Hutchinsons. From 1865 to 1940, uh, Sea Island Cotton supported um, low country freedmen economically. Henry Hutchinson was a man who built his entire career around growing Sea Island cotton um, and elevated his community through the, the production of Sea Island cotton. He was able to secure a better future for himself and his children through it. Um, I got ahead of myself there. But um, so up here on these photos, uh, over here on the right, this is a photo of Henry Hutchinson. And over to the left, you can't make it out uh, from this grainy photo, but that's actually a field of Sea Island cotton behind him. Over here on the far left is his gin house, circa 1900. This photo over here on the right is, I believe, in the late 1930s. Um, and down here, we have four different newspaper articles all on Henry Hutchinson. Two of them are about him delivering the first bale of Sea Island cotton to the Charleston market that year. And I believe this one from 1905 says he's been doing it for several years running. So he have, may have been, very well have been delivering the first bag of Sea Island cotton to the Charleston market, which was leading the world market. Um, for maybe more than a decade straight. Um, so when I, when I say he was a sea island cotton farmer, I mean it. He was serious about it. He was, he was up there with the best of them growing sea island cotton. Um, additionally, he kept growing sea island cotton after the bull weevil. This article over here is from 1930. He was the first person in the Charleston area to pick a cotton blossom off of his crops. So this is something that, or sea island cotton farming is something that Henry did his entire life. Um, born in, he was born in 1860. That's what he started doing when he grew up and in, when he passed, and still in 1930, when he was about 70 at the time, he was still planting cotton. So that's why it's so significant to the story of the Hutchinson House. The house was built by Henry Hutchinson, and we can't tell the story of Henry Hutchinson and the house without talking about Sea Island Cotton. So what is Sea Island Cotton? So Sea Island Cotton is, a, is an improved day neutral flowering cultivar of the tropical and perennial long staple cotton, Gossypium barbadense. Now, long staple cotton is a totally separate species from upland cotton, which is what we see planted all across the Midlands of South Carolina and into Georgia, and all throughout the Southeast. Um, these two are distinct species from different regions of um, Middle and South America is where um, they um, were originated from, uh, respectively. Um, upland cotton is from, our, I believe, Central America. It's native to Mexico. and. Uh, long staple cotton is native, they believe, to the Andes Mountains. It's hard to trace these because they were improved and distributed by Native Americans before colonization. Um, so it's hard to actually pinpoint where exactly they first originated. Um, one key difference with Sea Island cotton is that it loves hot, humid weather, rich, sandy soils, and it needs a long growing season in order to be productive. If you know anything about the Sea Islands, we have a lot of that hot and humid weather <laughs> down here. Uh, and all of our soil is sand. Uh, and the, the growing season is long. So um, that's why Sea Island cotton was grown here in the Sea Islands, because this is where it did best. It really was not productive anywhere else. You could grow Sea Island cotton anywhere, but if you didn't have the growing season, it didn't produce enough of a crop for it to really be worth your time. Upland cotton was more profitable to be grown in these regions that didn't have the long growing season. In that hot, humid weather, it just really elevated the, the growth and productivity of this plant a whole nother notch. And just to kind of drill down more into some of the details, uh, compared to upland cotton, sea island cotton is a much larger plant. It lacks hairs on its stem, which is the name Gossypium hirsutum. That means hairy cotton. So that's one of the key things uh, that's different between uh, upland cotton and long staple cotton, is upland cotton has hairs all over it, and long staple cotton doesn't. Long staple cotton has teardrop shaped fruits. Uh, it has five lobed leaves. You can see that up there on the left. Not every leaf is five lobed, but kind of uh, upland cotton, they tend to look more like maple leaves when they get a fifth lobe, whereas on sea island cotton, they look more like a hand. Um, 
Uh, sea island cotton, of course, has longer, finer fibers. That's why people were growing it. It has pastel yellow flowers rather than the sort of white or pastel pink flowers that upland cotton tends to have. It's very picky about its climate soil, and it has smooth, hard black seeds. That's kind of the defining characteristic with long, stable cottons uh, in the cotton industry, and why the, the two are, have separate production cycles and, and methodologies is upland cotton kind of just has a small, greenish, hairy seed where, um, that's soft and squishy. Uh, it's just covered from head to toe in a thick layer of fuzz, whereas sea island cotton and other long stable cottons have this large, hard, black, smooth seed. Um, the, yes, sir? Uh, it said day neutral flowering. What's that mean? Oh, um, um, since uh, long stable cotton is a tropical plant, tropical plants don't flower the way our plants do here in the temperate zone. They generally wait uh, until the, the um, uh, until like towards the winter solstice as the days start getting late in the year and they bloom about that time because in the tropics there's less so winter, spring, summer, fall and more so dry and wet. So they try to flower in the winter, um, which I believe is, don't call me on this, I think that's the dry period in the tropics. Am I right, Chris? I think so. Okay. Um, so if you planted regular long staple cotton and a lot of the, the original they believe that the original stock for sea island cotton came from the Caribbean, which was in the tropics. If you planted that here in the low country, it would wait until about this time of year to start flowering. And it takes 50 days for the fruit to set. So these things would flower in October and you might get a couple of seeds before the frost kills them. So see, the, the key to making sea island cotton separate, what separates it from long staple cotton is that they beat the, the um, the short day flowering tendency out of it. And so it just flowers as soon as it gets big enough now, which is a lot like our other, other cottons as well as a, a lot of our you know, spring flowering plants. Um, so the, the key thing that separated um, upland cotton from sea island cotton as a cash crop is the fibers. So sea island cotton tended to have fibers that were sometimes twice as long and half as thick as upland cottons. That meant that you could you could spin a thread that had very near the same you know, tensile strength, but was you know, half the thickness. You could get these exceptionally fine silk-like threads spun with sea island cotton, which was just totally impossible with upland cotton. And so because of this, sea island cotton was prized by the royalty, nobility, and affluent members of European society because it could be spun by master artisans into the finest muslins and the finest laces imaginable. Uh, silk was the only thing that could rival it at the time. Um, additionally, later, later on, you know, after the Industrial Revolution set in, Sea Island Cotton had a couple of really key niche, uh, you know, high-end engineering applications. It was ideal for high RPM drive belts because you could make a drive belt that was just as strong as one made from upland cotton, but it was, you know, weighed a third as much. So you could spin that drive belt a lot faster and it could, you know, help you condense down machinery. Uh, it was additionally, it was used in early bias ply tires because you could inflate the tires to a higher PSI because you had a stronger fiber embedded in the rubber. Uh, it was also used to make parachute cords and sew together airplane, sins, airplane um, skins as well as hot air balloon skins during World War I. So it wasn't just used to you know, make lace gowns for the nobility, it did also have you know, important engineering applications, although they were, it's, it's kind of only ever been used for these really niche fringe applications. It never made sense to make, you know, jeans out of sea island cotton because you could just as easily make it out of upland cotton. It was only on the, these extreme margins where, you know, the absolute maximum length and fineness of the fiber was important where sea island cotton really thrived as a cash crop. And that's why it commanded such high prices and additionally had such high variability in its economics was because if there wasn't a demand for these niche applications, there was no market for it. Um, I'll get in, into that here. Um, so as I said, sea island cotton is best suited for growth in the South Carolina and Georgia sea islands. Uh, and that's really just because of the, the humidity, the, um, uh, that long growing season, as well as these are very young soils here geologically, so they still have a lot of you know, nutritional richness left in them. Um, and the antebellum, it was grown at the plantation scale, and it was the dominant uh, cash, upland cash crop on the sea islands. Um, a lot of planters very early on sort of maintained their own proprietary strain. It was their brand or trademark, if you will. And so they would create 
develop and maintain their own special strain of Sea Island cotton because they were all trying, you know, to one-up every other planter. In order to get the, the highest dollar and grow the longest, finest fiber they could. Um, um, as a cash crop, um, Sea Island cotton was grown thoroughly and extensively on, on um, Edisto Island at the very least. And I'm going to refer a lot back to Edisto Island. That's just where I work. That's where I'm familiar with. But this applies to you know, Beaufort, John's Island, James Island, as well as all the way down through Savannah. Um, on Edisto Island, by the mid-1800s, all the freshwater wetlands on Edisto Island had been ditched, diked, and drained to the extent possible to grow Sea Island cotton unless they were suitable for rice cultivation. Then there was inland rice cultivation going on. Um, additionally, there were thousands of acres of high salt marsh. You know the, the extensive black needle rush marshes? Those were diked off, ditched, and then they installed trunks on them and they would let them fill up with freshwater outflows as well as rainwater to absorb all the salt out of the soil and then dump that out at low tide. And so they desalinated marshlands in order to plant more cotton. They had planted every arable acre they could, so they started converting salt marsh into cotton fields. Um, which that's, I still just can't get over. But um, <laughs> uh, Sea Island cotton, typically its harvest started in midsummer, and it would go all the way until the first frost. So if any of y'all are familiar with modern upland cotton cultivation, um, what they do nowadays is that they, um, they grow the crop out into about late summer, and then they defoliate the plant. And that causes the plant to drop all of its leaves, go into a, sort of a, a panic last ditch survival mode, and finish maturing all of its fruits before it finally just starves and dies. And then the plant dries out, all the bulbs open, and they run mechanical harvesters through to harvest it. Historically, that's not what happened. The, the plants just grew until they froze, and then the same things sort of happened. When that first, not a hard freeze, but hard frost came through, the cotton would drop its leaves, and then the plant would mature out its bulbs, and then the first hard freeze would kill off, or would top kill the plant. And so cotton kept maturing, and it kept coming in all the way past the first frost. So they were picking cotton all the way through Christmas, typically. Um, and then over the winter, the fields were prepped and everything, and the, the, uh, the remaining cotton was processed, shipped, and sold to, at market. Um, um, sea Island cotton had to go through many steps before it could be packed and shipped. It had to be dried, because typically, you know, if plants were harvested in the morning, like how it is right now, you'd have a really heavy dew on the plant, so you couldn't just bag the cotton. You couldn't process the cotton like that, because it would clump up, or it would damage the machinery, soak into the wood, and mess with tolerances, and that kind of stuff or would get moldy in storage, so the cotton had to be first dried out, then they had to sort it, which was getting rid of all the various trash and bits and bobs and you know, sticks and other garbage that had gotten um, into the cotton when it was picked. Then it had to be whipped, which, is, which fluffed up the cotton and beat all the loose sand and other material out of it. Then it was ginned, and then they moated it, which was to get all the other trash that got through it in the, that got through the ginning process. Then it was packed into big hemp sacks, about 300 pound sacks, about seven foot tall and three foot wide. And then it was shipped to market. Um, and another pet peeve I have that I have to go on a small little tangential rant about, is that Sea Island cotton was gin on a roller gin, which delicately pulled the lint away from the seed. And so the lint would pull through the rollers and the seed would fall off the other side. Eli Whitney did not invent the cotton gin. He invented a cotton gin. He invented the saw gin, which was absolutely critical for the, develop, or for the processing of upland cotton. The saw gen works with a series of hooked combs that pass through a rake. And so the reason why you need that to process upland cotton is, like I was talking about before, those small soft seeds covered from head to toe in fuzz. If you try and pass a, an upland cotton seed through a roller gen, it would just crush the seed or rip it in smithereens. And so you would just end up with nasty smush seed and little bits of broken seed husk in your cotton. So it was not efficient to ever be ginned on a roller gin. Now kind of modern roller gins can gin it, but back, you know, back in the, you know, the 1800s, there was no way to efficiently process upland gin. So when Eli Whitney invented the um, saw gin in, I think, 1792, that revolutionized the upland cotton industry, but it had no impact on the Sea Island cotton industry because they were using these roller gins, which date back to about 1100 AD from um, India. So, that was the big thing that Eli Whitney did. He didn't invent the cotton gin, just a cotton gin. It's an important cotton gin, but only one. Um, uh, additionally, another thing, important thing to talk about is the factor. I mentioned this earlier. So the factor was kind of the investor, lender, and broker for the farmer. 
So the farmer would take out a loan with the factory. That would allow them to cover all of the you know, fertilizer and fertilizer, horseshoes, food, you know, hay, whatever they had to buy in order to run the farm. Um, at the start of the season, they would take out a loan with the factor, and then the factor would charge them in bales of cotton to pay that back at the end of the season. So, um, so the, 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 the planter worked for the factor until they had paid back whatever loan they had, and then whatever um, cotton they had excess at the end of the season, the factor then bought that from them for cash, or they were free to sell it if they could find someone at a better price. But typically, they had no negotiated contract with the factor, that he would buy it from them at whatever rate, you know, market or lab, or whatever the market was, or up to a certain point or something like that. Uh, so the factor then was kind of like a stockbroker at the time. They would sit on all these bales of cotton in their warehouse at Charleston, Car uh, Charleston Harbor, and they would play the global market and see if they could hold on to the cotton long enough to sell it for the maximum price, or if they, you know, missed the peak and they then had to sell it at a loss later on in the season. So the, the factor played an important role because he was able to bankroll the operation and then sort of, it was on him to make his own profit at the end of the season. Um, so this kind of leveled up, leveled out the peaks and valleys for the planters, uh, as well as the, the freedmen farmers after the fact, um, in order to, you know, make, you know, cotton production not as tumultuous um, from an economic standpoint. Long-winded here. Um, so sea island cotton was developed on the sea islands of Georgia and South Carolina about 1790. Uh, the original stock is, uh, is um, expected to be a perennial cultivar from somewhere in the Caribbean. Um, you know, Barbados is, is one thought, or, thought about origin it, that comes in the, the scientific name, Gossipium barbadense, um, but it could have been from any number of different Caribbean islands. No one is really certain, but it was developed sometime between 1786 and 1790 on around Savannah, as well as around Edisto Island as well. It sort of spread around and it was a very short period of time that they were able to get the thing to flower day neutrally. I think they just kind of did attrition. They planted a bunch of seeds and then eventually some of them just through some sort of epigenetic miracle started flowering in day neutral fashion. That's the, the gist is what I get from the records. Um, but it was, only, it was only a matter of about five years before they had a day neutral flowering cultivar from this tropical plant, which is really interesting. Um, but that's lost to history as far as most people know how they actually did that. Um, in the first quarter of the 1800s, there was kind of a gold rush era, or gold rush-esque scramble to grow as much cotton as could possibly be grown. Um, the indigo market had collapsed because the, the, if you know anything about that, the British were paying us a bounty on indigo and then we started shooting at them so they stopped doing that. So then there was no reason to sell indigo anymore. Uh, so people were looking for a new upland cash crop to start growing and so the kind of sea island cotton and upland cotton both became um, efficient and highly lucrative cash crops about the same time. Eli Whitney's gin was invented in 1792, and, and Sea Island cotton was birthed from long staple cotton around the same time, a few years earlier. Um, um, and there were hundreds of plantations that sprung up just, just on Edisto Island and Johns Island alone, just in a matter of decades. Um, for as many people as possible were trying to carve out, you know, 200, 300 acres somewhere and plant, put as much cotton in the ground as possible. It, early in the plantation period, um, the focus was, was on maximizing um, the quality of the product you were producing and to get the um, highest value you possibly could per pound of cotton. Um, and that's kind of how, how you know, the trend was, how the market was, how the, you know, the, the just kind of bragging rights was going in the, in the sort of plantation aristocracy at that time. Um, and then as, as the profitability of sea island cotton started to die down as the market got saturated, you know, you, you had the, the people who came out on the far end who just had established a long lasting brand and reputation and had a really high quality product. They were selling for absorbent rates and everyone else was kind of just competing against each other for somewhere in, in the middle of the road for mediocrity. Um, and so at that point, plantations stopped focusing on maximizing quality and they started focusing on maximizing yield and productivity. So they started you know, utilizing fertilizers and more mechanized you know, forms of harvest and, and cultivation and that kind of stuff. Um, they started you know, planting every acre they could. This is when they started draining the wetlands and, and converting salt marsh and that kind of stuff was as we, you know, up towards about the 1840s into the 1850s. Um, and then you know, the market was starting to fall before the Civil War even happened. Um, and 
during the Civil War, um, on Edisto Island at the very least, there was no Sea Island cotton production because Edisto Island was evacuated just a couple months after the shots were fired um, at Fort Sumter. So Sea Island, that's an interesting little nugget here is that Sea Island cotton was kind of its own little independent anarchy uh, during the Civil War. There was no permanent Union occupation, nor was there you know, any Confederate occupation. So the freedmen who were, I guess at that point they weren't quite freedmen yet, the, the, the former slaves who were living on Edisto Island were self-governed. And so they just ran Edisto Island as they had. They, they farmed, they produced, or they produced their own crops, their own food, that kind of stuff. And this happened for about a five-year period um, during the war period, or war, during the uh, Civil War. It's four years, so 1861 to um, uh, 1865. So that's just a quick little history nugget there. Uh, after the Civil War, um, sea island cotton was still planted extensively all across the sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia. Um, much of the cultivation uh, was still being done underneath the plantation sharecropping system, which was still borderline slavery. Um, however, a great deal of cotton was being grown by independent freedmen farmers, like the Hutchinsons. Um, and so this was an extremely lucrative, um, uh, it, was, it was a very profitable thing for freedmen farmers to do on the Sea Islands during that time. Um, and, and Henry and James made, made quite a lot of wealth doing this. Um, on the Sea Islands, as well as, as, well as other uh, freedmen farmers at the time. Um, however, uh, by the, the late 1800s, um, Sea Island cotton started to face competition from Egypt. Um, the United States was not producing as much Sea Island cotton as they were before the war, and so there was a bit of a, a demand vacuum, and so Egypt started growing its own um, long staple cotton, what eventually became Egyptian cotton, which is actually a hybrid between Sea Island cotton and I think an Asiatic cotton. So all Egyptian cotton is actually descended from Sea Island cotton. And another interesting point there, all Pima cotton is descended from Egyptian cotton. So all modern long staple cottons are in fact a descendant of Sea Island cotton. However, they've all been hybridized with other forms of cotton. So they're no longer Sea Island cotton, but they've taken a lot of its, you know, uh, a lot of the qualities uh, from Sea Island cotton that made it successful as a cash crop. And they've incorporated that into these new modern hybrids. Um, so Egypt started stealing market share from the United States Sea Island cotton production. Um, and so it was with every passing decade, Egypt was taking more and more of the market away from the United States. Um, and then it all got worse in the 1900s because the boll weevil started spreading east from Texas. Now the boll weevil is a native parasite of upland cotton, which is native to Central America. Um, so the boll weevil was, um, living peacefully in Mexico, feeding on native cottons. And then we decided to plant upland cotton all the way from Virginia to Texas. And so they jumped the Rio Grande Valley and then spread like a wildfire down the Eastern seaboard. And by the 1920s, they had reached the sea islands of South Carolina. And by the late 1920s, they had extended all across the United States. And they absolutely decimated the sea island cotton um, you know, market. Um, the thing that made the boll weevil so destructive is that it didn't hurt the plant. It fed on the inside of the developing bowl and it ate the developing fiber. So you would get these plant, plants that otherwise look perfectly healthy, but they're dropping all of their flowers, dropping all of their new bowls, and the bowls that do come through are just an absolute mess of disgusting, rotten lint. And what lint is there has been shredded by the boll weevils themselves. So it totally decimated the yield of sea island cotton. And sea island cotton, which as I said before, sort of, um, lived and died on the margins of the cotton industry in these really high-end applications could no longer sustain the high qualities that were necessary for it to even carve out that economic niche. So that market totally collapsed by the end of the, or by the, end of the 1920s. Upland cotton was still able to hang on because it, was, because it had adapted with the boll weevil, it was less susceptible to damage from the boll weevil, and because the fibers were shorter to begin with, it didn't get as, you know, the, there was more usable fiber left over at the end. So, so upland cotton still continued, although terribly wounded from an economic standpoint, but Sea Island cotton, the market completely collapsed. Um, uh, in the 1930s, the USDA kickstarted an effort um, to revitalize the Sea Island cotton industry. They, they distributed thousands upon thousands of Sea Island cotton seeds all throughout um, the Sea Islands of South Carolina, as well as the interior of the Georgia coastal plain, as well as Northern Florida. Uh, to independent farmers uh, to get them to try and grow Sea Island cotton um, as, as well as practice, you know, 
um, best management practices for controlling and eradicating the boll weevil. Um, but ultimately it failed because where these farmers started up, they were growing sea island cotton amidst uh, upland cotton, so they weren't able to maintain um, the, the genetic you know, integrity of the sea island cotton. Because af after a year, they would, you, even if they were nowhere near other um, upland cotton, when they took it to the gin, that gin was ginning upland cotton. So they would end up with upland cotton seeds in their sea island cotton seeds, and then when they plant them, they'd have upland cotton in their field, and then it would hybridize, and after a couple of years, they would have these, these hybrid plants that were not producing you know, productive sea island cotton. And so it, it eventually became untenable, and after you know, I think less than a decade, the USDA shut down that program. In the late 1930s, they started up a breeding program in Florence, South Carolina at the PD Research Station. And this was uh, to breed um, both boll weevil resistant strains of sea island cotton as well as sea island and upland cotton hybrids that kind of had the best, the best fiber qualities of sea island cotton but with the boll weevil resistance of the upland cotton. In order to do this, they maintained pure strains of sea island cotton so that they could back cross them to try and preserve whatever traits they needed. Um, this moved from the uh, Florence Research Station in 1939 to Johns Island because they determined that they didn't have the horribly oppressive hot humid weather in Florence that they had uh, in the Sea Islands. And they also didn't have all the other necessary soil characteristics or that extended growing season. So they moved to Johns Island in order to kind of give the sea cotton the best chance it could to be the most productive and to accelerate um, the breeding because you know, it was taking the plants too long to mature and so they weren't able to get as many generations in in a year. Uh, however, by 1942, they shut down that program and shipped it off to Georgia and they focused exclusively on trying to get sea island cotton genes into upland cotton plants rather than trying to make hybrids or to improve sea island cotton. And it's kind of considered at that point that that was officially when sea island cotton died as a crop in the United States. So, with that in mind, we have to note the consequences that sea island cotton had for the low country and the sea islands of South Carolina. So, the production of sea island cotton, like all plantation cap crops, took an immeasurable toll on the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, enslaved men and women all across the low country of South Carolina suffered underneath this crop in the plantation economy. Um, the planter efforts to preserve the sea island cotton industry, um, which around the Charleston area was dependent and necessitated the use of Charleston Harbor, likely fueled the events that precipitated the Civil War, the firing on Fort Sumter and all that. Um, in addition to the, the toll it took on human lives, it also had, it left an indelible mark on the ecology, geology, and hydrology of the Low Country and the Sea Islands of South Carolina. Um, as I stated before, Edisto Island was practically scraped bare of trees. Every single wetland was ditched and drained. In great expanses of high marsh were burned and desalinated, all just to make more cotton fields. It fundamentally altered the landscape of Edisto Island. Um, these scars from centuries plus back in history still have impacts to the ecology of Edisto Island to this day. Um, you know, these historic practices extirpated certain species from Edisto Island. That we have records that were on the island before and that no longer exist. There are plants that I see commonly all throughout the Megat Adams Run area, as well as on Johns Island or down on Spring Island, that are just gone from Edisto Island because the island was changed so fundamentally for so many years. Um, and unlike rice infrastructure, which you know, over time through its careful use has actually preserved a lot of bio biodiversity and actually enhanced it in some capacities. Uh, in the brackish marshes of, um, of the low country. It has had its own set of damages, but through its careful use, it has actually improved or maintained biodiversity. Practically all of the, the infrastructure for sea island cotton has been damaging uh, to some extent. It, in its, you know, because it has not been maintained, because it has not been carefully used, because it was you know, reused for either truck cropping or, some, or something like that, it has simply led to greater ecological degradation. Sea island cotton, cultivation left a lasting mark upon all facets of the low country. With that being said, y'all finally have all the context you need to understand the invaluable historical context of Sea Island cotton as it pertains to the low country of South Carolina, to Edisto Island, to the Hutchinson House, and to the story of the Hutchinson family. Sea Island cotton was a cash crop endemic to the Sea Islands of South Carolina and Georgia. It was the most common upland plant on the Sea Islands for over a century. I want you to think about that. It was the most common plant on the sea islands. 
Just like how in South Carolina today, more than 50% of the trees are loblolly pines in the state of South Carolina, on the sea islands, the most common plant was sea island cotton. Not any native plant, not Spartina, at least maybe out here in Beaufort, Spartina probably was giving it a run for its money. But on Edisto Island, John's Island, and James Island, sea island cotton was the most abundant plant. Um, the entire economy of the sea islands revolved around the cultivation of, of sea island cotton. Millions of people spent their entire lives cultivating this crop. Many enslaved people suffered for it. At the same time, or slightly later, yet many freedmen found prosperity with it. Um, the very ground we walk was turned over countless times in the pursuit of sea island cotton. The very landscape we live in is still influenced by its scarring infrastructure. And then over the span of just a few decades, it just disappeared from the landscape. We cannot understand our past and if we don't understand sea island cotton. Sea island cotton, excuse the horrible puns here, is the thread that stitches the long history of the low country together, it is the weft that wove the canvas upon which our story was painted. So now I can start the rest of the talk. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try and power through this real quick, but. Y'all are guinea pigs, this is the first time I've actually had a PowerPoint to use, so. It's a little front loaded, apparently. Um, <laughs> so this is my journey with Sea Island Cotton. So in, as I said, in 2016, we purchased the Hutchinson House, and that was the impetus for me taking on this project. Um, in late 2018, a man named Bill McLean approached my boss um, and said, hey, I've got some Sea Island cotton seeds. You can have them if you want to grow them at the Hutchinson House as part of your historical interpretation. So my boss turned to me and said, Tom, can you grow Sea Island cotton? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> and down the rabbit hole I fell. Um, in 2019, just a few months later, I was hired on full time by the Oyster Island Open Land Trust, and I've been working on this project all throughout my full time tenure there since. So the foremost question on the front of probably all of your minds, as well as my mind when I took this on is, is this really Sea Island cotton? Well, here's the provenance I've been able to pick together, kind of all the background information that was lying around out there in the public records. In 1939, the USDA put seeds from a bleak hull strain of Sea Island cotton into cryo storage, and around that same time, they closed down their shop in um, uh, the PD research station in Florence, and they moved everything to John's Island. If you know anything about Edisto Island history, bleak hull, um, was a plantation on Nesto Island that was an absolute titan of sea island cotton production. It was one of the major exporters of not only lint, but also cotton seed for other farmers who couldn't maintain their own, um, couldn't maintain their own, own seed lineage, or if they were just starting up, they were exporting seed to other planters. So they were kind of the dominant, you know, plantation in all of, you, of the U.S. sea island cotton production. Um, and they're arguably one of the most world-renowned producers as far as quality goes. You know, there's, I believe there's a medal at the Edisto Island Museum that John Townsend was presented for, for producing the finest quality cotton in some year at some time. And it's, it's rumored that his cotton was bought out by the Queen of England annually for several years running just to produce her own clothing from it. This was kind of the creme de la creme of the Sea, of sea Island cotton plantations and of the Sea Island cotton you know, lineages out there which is probably why they picked it as a back cross, because it was so ubiquitous, it was so standard, and it was one that had proven for decades, even well, over a century, um, that it was that it was a, a quality seed stock to, to base research from. Um, nowadays, Bleak Hall is part of uh, South Carolina DNR's Botany Bay Heritage Preserve. If you've ever been to Botany Bay on Edison Island, you've been through Bleak Hall Plantation. Um, so this cache of seeds that the USDA put in the cryo storage in 1939 eventually ended up in their cotton collection in Texas, and the sort of full context surrounding this accession wasn't really digitized in 1994 when they started digitizing records. All they did was put the name and the date that it went into cryo storage, and that's all that was out there in the public record. So in 2015, uh, William McLean read Dr. Porsche's 2005 treatise on the story of sea island cotton. Bill read that, and I'm gonna put words in his mouth here, but I figure he probably said something out loud along the lines of, there's no way that sea island cotton's extinct. So he hopped on Google, and he found the, the United States National Plant Germplasm System, searched for sea island cotton on it, and he recognized the name Bleak Hall out of the hundreds of sea island cotton cultivars that are listed on there, the vast majority of which have probably no relation to sea island cotton. So he just ordered up 25 seeds for research purposes and they sent them to his house. But Bill's a real estate attorney, by the way. He's not a horticulturalist, so. Um, he just ordered seeds from there, apparently. Um, 
So Bill actually knew Bernie Maybank, who's a longtime supporter of the NSO on Open Land Trust, um, and often on board member, and he also owns part of Point of Pines Plantation, just down the road from the Hutchinson House. So Bill got with Bernie, he planted some seeds out on his property, they all came up, they all looked good, he, he got in touch with Charleston County Parks and Rec, and he got them to plant a quarter acre of Sea Island cotton at, um, at the McLeod Plantation County Park. Um, they grossly underestimated the amount of labor it would take to maintain and cultivate and pick a quarter acre of cotton, um, so they didn't do that again. Um, but, he got a, <laughs> but he got a duffel bag full of cotton seed out of it. Um, and from that 2017 planting is where my seeds came from in 2018 that started this project. Uh, and additionally, floating around out there, there was a pre-existing 2001 genetic study that utilized this accession from the, the U.S. National Plant Germplasm System. They indicated that this bleak hall cultivar was an unrelated, unrelated, distinct, unhybridized cultivar of long staple cotton. And so this is kind of all the pieces being put together. So that's the Ziploc sandwich bag of seeds that I got in the park, park at 6 p.m. from Bill. Um, up there is the National Ger Plant Germplasm System listing for this accession. As you can see, it was put into cryo storage in 1939, and the name is Bleak Hall Sea Island, and that's really all the information that was contained within it. Um, but over here is a 1974 bulletin from the USDA about breeding quality cotton at the PD Experiment Station in Florida, South Carolina. And you can see up there, it says that they were crossing Sea Island and upland varieties, and that they had a Bleak Hall Sea Island that they were crossing this one hybrid back with in order to maintain it, or in order to pull um, uh, various characteristics out of it. And then that accession over here is where, that is, I believe, where this accession came from. It's not the smoking gun yet. It's not, you know, concrete proven, but it doesn't seem like a coincidence to me. Um, and then if you look down over here, here is this 2001 genetic study. If you look, and this is sort of three-dimensionally mapping the interrelatedness of all of these different um, varieties of both upland cotton and long staple cotton. And as you can see, all the upland cottons are over here, all the long staple cottons are over here, and then kind of all the way out in this far corner over here, away from everything else, are these two strains called Bleak Hall and Seabrook Sea Island. Um, and if you notice, these two are actually somewhat related to Pima cottons, as well as Egyptian cottons, which we know are direct descendants of Sea Island cotton. So this, I think, it still needs to be fully vetted out and proven, but I think is the smoking gun that indicates that these are, in fact, not hybridized with upland cotton to any significant degree, and they are also distinct and significant from all other you know, modern long staple cottons, which, for the most part, I believe all of these are hybrids. Um, so with that kind of answering the question well enough that I was willing to tell people that this is probably Sea Island cotton, um, pending genetic studies to verify or disprove that and tell me whether or not I wasted five years. Um, <laughs> started preparing to land. So for 2019, the goal was simple. Um, don't kill all of them and get some fluffy white stuff out of it. Um, so I got a, a picked out a 25 by 25 plot out there at the Hutchinson House. Um, and just to play it safe, I followed the, the cultivation descriptions listed in Dr. Porche's um, book to the T just to make sure um, that you know, I had the best chance of not killing everything in a dramatic and, and comical fashion. Um, the soil out there after a soil test was, showed that it was fertile and it needed very literal, or very minimal amendment, which was surprising and shocking considering it had been in cultivation for several hundred years. Um, and also I put up deer fencing preemptively because I know that deer can turn a very expensive garden into a very expensive pile of dirt very fast. Um, <laughs> So here I am forming the beds. So the historical description is that these had very high um, beds, um, with very deep alleys between them. And kind of historically what they would do is they would put down fertilizer, organic matter, as well as all the dead plants into the alley, and then they would push the bed over it. So they would kind of just move the beds back and forth. Uh, and these beds are on a six foot spacing. And um, it was, like I said, this was only a 25 by 25 plot. I was not planting a quarter acre. I planted 500 square feet because um, I, I kind of knew what I was getting into. Um, soil amelioration, and as you can see over here, these are really good. Um, all I needed was some manganese, and of course on these coastal soils, a little bit of sulfur, a little bit of nitrogen, and uh, with cotton in particular, a little bit of boron uh, always goes a long way. Um, so that's what I used, some roach killers, some manganese sulfate, some crushed up you know, dental models. All the manganese sulfate, orthophoric acid, and you know, 
magnesulfate you get, I think that cost me like $15. So, <laughs> but that got the whole plot done. Um, <laughs> irrigation was in quotes. I uh, put in a pitcher pump and just used that to hand water the plants when it looked like they were about to die. Um, and the experimental procedure was I did 52 plants. Um, I experimented with seed depth. I did them at two inches, one inch, half inch, quarter inch. And I put all the seeds three inches apart in each of these spaces. I had four rows spaced six foot apart. And I had 13 plants in each row, each spaced 18 inches apart from each other. And like I said, I had four seeds in each space because I wanted to see which depth would work well. Cotton has a very large seed. Um, so you would think that it would want to be very deep, but at the same time, the deeper you put the seed in the soil, the harder it is for that seed to get out. Um, and so I also experimented with fertilization just to see how much the cotton would benefit from having additional fertilization. So I only fertilized the center two rows. I put micronutrients everywhere, but I only put 10, 10, 10 in the first two rows. Um, and then I also only irrigated the first two rows once you know, they were established, um, just to see what kind of difference that would have. And of course, weed control was uniform, and I also hilled the plants, which is I kind of created like a little bowl around the plants out of dirt, so that when they got rained on or irrigated, the water would go, rather than cheating right off the side of the, the bed, I could at least get some you know, um, penetration into the soil. So here's germination. Cotton seed just sort of pulls itself up out of the ground, and it's got two cotyledons to start out with. Um, and that's kind of the hilling I was showing. Um, I kind of just created a kind of bowl around them just to um, minimize erosion and facilitate uh, infiltration. Um, and that's the growth of the plants throughout the year, um, going down like that and over to the side. And this is the kind of the life cycle of the fruit and development, um, the fruiting and the development of the, the actual um, bowl. So the flower actually has kind of a three color phases. It comes out initially like this very rich, pretty pastel yellow. It looks a lot like an okra flower, but bigger and showier. They don't actually open all the way. At least this strain does not. Um, they sort of stay closed up like you see up here. But on the second day, they turn this sort of vibrant magenta pink. And on the, the third day, they turn brown before they finally fall off. Um, so you can actually kind of age the flowers when you're in the field surveying and collecting data. Then over time, the, the bowl, after just a few weeks, kind of reaches full size, and it just kind of sits there in this sort of upper right position um, until it eventually dries out. And when it dries, this is the hyssop fruit. So as it dries, it kind of, the, the water, the water pressure that was holding the fruit closed goes away, and the fruit just kind of pops open. And at that point, the, the lint dries out, and it starts to fluff up as it gets exposed to wind and you know, um, weather. And here is the, the lint itself. You can see me measuring the staple up there. That's at the one inch mark just because my ruler wasn't that good. Um, and so as you can see up, well, you can't really see, but it's, I had at the very least a, a one in seven, or no, sorry, one in nine sixteenths uh, length staple, um, which um, a lot of contemporary at the time, a lot of upland cottons were floating around about the three quarter to seven eighths of an inch length of their fiber. So this is full on double that. Um, and right down here, I want you to note, this is the, the gin cleaned cotton. Um, note that kind of creamy, sort of light beige, as well as the silky luster to it. That is noted consistently in, in the historical records, something that separates long staple cottons from upland cotton. Um, and looking just down there at the fibers, that is, I think, at like 40x, might be 60x. Um, just note how fine those fibers are. Um, so I had a lot of difficulties. I know I'm scrapped for time, so you just tell me when to shut up, Chris. But <laughs> I won't go into all of these. Um, but uh, yeah, I learned that I needed to plant later, um, and that you know I definitely need to irrigate these things. I definitely needed to fertilize them. Um, one of the issues I ran into is because I planted them late, and additionally, we consistently have had a May drought on Edisto Island ever since I started planting, so except for this year, it was weird. Um, but sorsion was something that the, the seedlings developed uh, whenever they were dry. And this is a fungal disease that girdles the, the plant at the base of the stem. And so this happens uh, whenever they don't get enough irrigation because they can't grow fast enough. So the fungus is able to get in there and damage the plant before it's able to outgrow that fungus. Um, so that was something new I learned about. Uh, also, um, a lot of the issues with sea island cotton actually track very well with upland cotton. So that was a godsend because I didn't have to figure all that out because there's plenty of USDA bulletins on how to grow upland cotton. So I was able to relate a bunch of stuff to that, or I would have been 
very much you know without a paddle, put it that way. Um, bull rot was another thing I ran into, and this is a problem that still plagues me to this day. Um, if the cotton doesn't get enough boric acid, um, it can't really mature its seeds. So the seeds don't quite ever the seeds don't harden up, and it can lead to um, the bull rotting when it opens. Additionally, these little stinkers right here, these stink bugs, um, they feed on the maturing bull, and the stink bugs themselves aren't really a problem. They kind of they suck this, the vigor out of the plant, so they can reduce your yield in that way. The real main problem with them is that they carry a bacterial bull rot. And so when they feed on, the, on bulls, they actually infect the bull with this bull rot, and it comes out looking. I get two or generally I have three locules in a bull, and usually it's two of them have some amount of rot in them. And if I'm lucky, I get a clean bull, or at least a clean locule out of them. Um, so I'm not big on just blindly spraying insecticides all, all over the place, so I don't really have an effective way to get rid of the sink bugs other than buying parasitoid wasps off of Amazon, which is, don't know how that well they'll survive the, the ship shipping down here. So I haven't tried that yet, but we might try that soon. Um, Hurricane Dorian came through, didn't really do all that much to the plants, but it did kind of bend them all over the place, and so it affected their growth form. But the actual, there was very little damage to the plants themselves, and this was not a particularly strong hurricane, if you remember it, it was a cat one. Um, so, um, at the end of 2019, um, let me see. I, I collected a bunch of data. I was out there every single week, if not twice a week, handwriting down data on every single plant in the most excruciating minute detail because I wanted to be able to deeply analyze this at the end of the year to see whether or not these were matching up with historic phenological records and that kind of stuff, as well as I had aims of doing seed selection, but those quickly died um, because this is a lot of work. Um, but I had... Um, 81% germination, and it ended up being that planting the seeds, you know, these are big seeds. These are like four or five okra seeds stuffed together. Um, they're kind of like about half the size of an almond. They want to be a quarter inch under the soil, a quarter to a half inch, which is surprising um, because Porsche's book says that they were putting them four inches under the ground, and I put them two inches under the ground, and only like three quarters of them germinated, and the ones at a quarter of an inch, 90% of them germinated. And the issue was that they were getting locked under the soil whenever it rained. And so that weight of the water was actually trapping them down under the earth. So that was one key thing that I learned from the study. Uh, but, you know, as far as time to bowl maturation um, and that kind of stuff, um, everything seemed to be right on the money. But um, I'll quickly blow through these right now. Um, but uh, actually, oh, wait, this is, sorry, this is the best part. Um, so, um, so processing sea island cotton is a multi-step process. It is very tedious. Um, I stored the raw seed cotton indoors in linen bags, and that basically means I put them in a crocus sack and left them in the back of my car for several months. Um, but after I, I put, told, pulled those out of the car and then pulled them out of the sack, I had to remove all the dirt, leaves, stained lint, neps, failed seeds, um, rotten seeds, rotten lint, and any other detritus that ended up going in with the picked cotton. And then after that was done, I then had to whip the cotton, which is I basically had to take every single seed and do this, like I was fluffing up a cotton ball for all four pounds of cotton I had. Um, and then once they were thoroughly whipped, I then had to gin them. And they don't sell Sea Island cotton gins anymore, surprisingly. Uh, so I had to then design and build my own electric power, electric double roller cotton gin. And then after that was done, then the gin still beats up the seeds, so then you have to pull anything that managed to get through the ginning and sorting process. Then after that, I put them in a linen bag and then I stuffed them in a closet somewhere. Um, so anyway, uh, like I was saying, I had to reverse engineer patent drawings from the 1800s in order to build a cotton gin. Um, and so it was based off of a sewing machine treadle and <laughs> lots of pulleys and various gears off of eBay and other things. And there's a Corvette body mount up there that I have a socket stuffed in as a tensioner. And um, it works. Um, and so here's a quick little video of me running the thing just off of the treadle. I learned that I don't have the hand-eye coordination in order to feed cotton while running a sewing machine treadle with my feet on a jury rigged system. Um, and so you note here that the, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, ignore that, it's not doing it on this screen, but. <laughs> um, it's the build suspense. It's, yeah, I did it on purpose. Uh, anyway, well, that didn't work. Um, 
But anyway, there's a really cool video going on right here on the laptop of this being Jen. Maybe, so. um, maybe if you want to minimize it, just pull yeah. the video by itself, and then you can. I'll do that. I don't get it. Hold on. Probably don't want to get your fingers between the scrolls. You do not. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Um, <laughs> So are the plants still growing? They're still growing. Uh, I've been growing them for five years. Um, so 2019 was a really good year. 2020, um, I planted it at two separate sites. I'll just go through these other slides. Yeah, I'll figure it out. You keep going. Um, so uh, in 2020, I planted it at two separate sites. I planted them at the Hutchinson House. I kind of I expanded the uh, plot to be a full 100 plants rather than just 50. And I added a row of Guatemalan indigo just to play around with that. And I foolishly did not put the deer fence back up because the deer didn't touch it the prior year. The deer very much touched it in 2020. Um, I then had, I, but at the same time, I also planted about 100, no, I planted 70 plants um, at King's Market on Edisto Island, which is a, um, active, um, an active um, farm on Edisto Island in modern agricultural settings underneath plastic with in-ground irrigation and, and soil that had been fertilized to sin. Um, and the plants did spectacularly. That photo that you saw on the very, on the Third slide with me standing next to a plant. That's one of the plants at, at King's Market. Those plants got nine and a half feet tall. Um, that was the thing with Sea Island Cotton I forgot to note. Upland Cotton has kind of been bred to just kind of get about waist high before it kind of stops growing. Sea Island Cotton was a leggy plant. You know, it grows like a Confederate rose. It'll just keep going. Um, and I also, in 2020, I experimented with pruning the plant. So I left the plants in the ground. I didn't pull them up and I just added new beds on the side of it. They do not work as perennial plants. Um, they, they just, the plant stays alive underground, but it does not come back out of the ground. About 50% of the plants put out shoots, but none of them flowered. They just kind of grew as like a sort of scraggly gnarled scrub. It was very interesting. Um, I think if you grew them in a greenhouse, they would probably do all right, but I don't think they, I think that kind of perennial nature has been bred out of them to a significant degree. I don't know if they would revert back to a day neutral or to a, a short day flowering cycle if you did that. But um, what I learned from 2020 is that deer fencing is yes, do that. And um, that they will, they will take whatever you give them as far as irrigation and fertilization goes and they will get bigger. Now, one problem I ran into in 2020 is that I had them next to a, a weedy ditch between a row of zinnias and sunflowers. So there was about a thousand times more stink bugs than there were in the Hutchinson house. So my yields were decimated because of bull rot. And so I've still been dealing with bull rot every year since, and deer. Um, but, so that's what I learned in 2020. In 2021, I had another crop failure. Uh, the deer busted through all my fencing um, and got in there and ate most of the stuff. Um, 2022 was um, better. I finally got some in-ground irrigation in place. I had spaced all the plants out, six foot rows, two foot plant spacing, um, and I had 100 plants going. And let me see. I got in-ground irrigation in place. I got white landscape fabric down. Um, and so everything was looking perfect. The deer were staying out of it. I had electric fence wire up. It wasn't electrified, but the deer couldn't break it now because it was made out of steel. Um, and then something I did not expect, the the crabgrass growing underneath the landscape fabric, because previously I had been using 20 year black landscape fabric with a felt liner. I switched to a five mil white landscape fabric and it was not sufficiently suppressing weed growth under it. It was kind of, light was still getting through it and it wasn't cooking the weeds underneath the soil because I was trying not to stress out, you know, the cotton plants when they were young by boiling all the water out of the soil. And so all this crabgrass lifted all of my 1,200 nine inch land, or here, I'll just I'll zoom on down to that now. All right, so thank you, Chris. Um, so there's one of those plants. I'm six foot, flat footed, and there's that plant growing over the top of me. Um, and so yeah, perennial plants didn't work out. 2021 uh, didn't do great. Deer still got through it. I got busy at work, didn't have time to get to it, and you know, yeah, you know that goes. Um, 2022, I got the irrigation and got the white landscape fabric, but. The, this crabgrass basically acted like a million little tiny hydraulic jacks and just lifted this 609 inch sod staples out of the ground. 
and just picked up the landscape fabric and flipped it over and just started growing. It was obscene. And then the deer got in. Um, <laughs> and then I had to shut the irrigation off to kill the grass because I was just feeding, I was just pumping water into these little hydraulic jacks that were lifting all my landscape fabric out. So 2023 has been much better, except I accidentally got some that camera on it when I was spraying weeds in the, in the parking lot. And cotton is apparently extremely sensitive to it's either dicamera or 2,4-D uh, herbicides. And it does these, this weird stuff with the leaves called strapping. Um, so now I know not to use that anywhere near them. Um, but that's all I've learned so far this year. The deer have stayed out, thankfully. I put cinder blocks on top of the landscape fabric um, and I just left it where it was so I didn't disturb the weed bed. Uh, but this year has been going pretty good so far. Um, just to go back real quick to the gin. So, this is actually a do-it-yourself um, double roller gin that design that I did just so I could put that out there in case anyone else was insane enough to start growing sea island cotton again. <laughs> they at least didn't have to do this part themselves. Um, and so you can make that out of a, a dowel and like two two by fours. No, just one two by four. Um, and some deers you order off of Alibaba. Um, and that's it. What do we do with the cotton? Well, it sits in a bag. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, I'll get to that in one second. Um, so for the future, um, this is purely for historical interpretation within the context of the Edge Island Open Land Trust. We do want to see if there's any way we can get a marketable product out of this, something that we can at least sell as a fundraiser to support you know, the Cotton Project as well as the Hutchinson House as a whole, something we might be able, we're gonna have a gift shop there probably at the Hutchinson House. We'd love to be able to sell cotton grown on the site or something as, as a souvenir. Um, I want to try and cultivate some, pun intended, partnerships with small farmers and enthusiasts um, who want to try and start growing sea island cotton again. Um, might even make sense to try and seed an artisan cotton, cotton industry if people on the sea islands want to, you know, grow some cotton in their backyard to, you know, start up an Etsy shop or something. I have been collaborating with some researchers in R&D programs. Um, I've got a genetic study that I'm supposed to get sometime, but I haven't heard back from them, and I also sent some stuff. Um, to a manufacturing company and an uh, um, extension agent to get some research done on that as well, but again, have not heard anything back from that. And maybe, just maybe, there might be a short book in the works. I tried writing a, a manuscript and uh, was aiming for eight pages, ended up at 17, I was still in the introduction, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there might end up being a booklet at some point if I ever get this other book done. Um, and then the other obvious question is, what do you do with all the cotton? Um, so hand spinning is incredibly time consuming and it requires an immense amount of skill. Um, and that is just not something that's in the cards for me. And then weaving is also another set of, you know, requires a lot of skill and is also very time consuming. You also have to have a lot of specialized equipment. And just to be able to spin all of the potential out of sea island cotton, you have to be a master spinner in the first place. So that's just untenable. I'd have, to, I'd have to have enough to be able to send it to a facility to get it spun on some sort of machine, and then I would have to know what to tell them, otherwise they're just going to charge me and send me back a big, like, twisted knot or something. So, um, um, yeah, that's all I, was, I, I might have enough cotton at this point in time to make two handkerchiefs, so <laughs> we'll see. But just here's a quick comparison of sea island cotton versus upland cotton. You can see how far upland cotton has come as a cultivar in the last hundred years, how much more cotton they've been able to pack into the bowls. And, and upland cotton has been bred in order to be machine harvested. Um, sea island cotton in its current configuration, you just can't do it. Um, too many leaves, too small of a bowl, those bowls stay really tight knit in there. Because these fibers are so fine and they're so tightly woven and they're so long, they don't puff up like upland cotton. They just kind of come out of one side of the seed and they just kind of stay as a tight, kind of looks like that inside of the plant. Um, so I don't think this stuff can ever be machine harvested. Um, and so I still have a lot of research, outstanding research questions I'm slowly working on. Um, this seabird possession that I pointed out in that genetic study, um, I don't know of anyone who has gotten those seeds, but as you saw in that, in that graph, it clearly tracked right down there with Bleak Hall. Um, and if you know anything about the Seabrooks, that was uh, another very influential, very successful um, cotton planting family on Edisto Island. So that's potentially two pure pedigrees of sea island cotton that have been preserved from Edisto Island alone, uh, which is remarkable in and of itself. Like I was saying, with, with the Hutchinson House project, these things have just kind of fallen out of the woodwork. It's of all the, all the, the sea island cotton strains that could have been preserved, 
the two that Henry Hutchinson was probably growing, it probably grew both at some point in time, or both apparently been in the USDA possession for 70 years, they didn't know about it, um, which is just freakish. Um, another thing is, as I was talking about with perennial plants, do they um, experience quality degradation or revert back to a tropical nature when they're grown in a greenhouse? Um, can selective breeding kind of bring back some of the, the productivity and fiber length and that kind of stuff? Or has this, is this strain kind of already had all of the ability for it to run out and revert back to a wild type bred out of it at this point. It's, you know, this strain has been developed for probably over, probably a full hundred years that it was being developed either by the Townsends or by the USDA. Um, I'm also looking into invisible sterilization of seeds inside a whole bowl. Um, another thing I did, forgot to mention is that cotton production in the United States and South Carolina is still um, subject to the boll weevil quarantine. So I have to get a $40 permit every single year just to plant this stuff. And I talked to the people at Clemson Extension and they were not, they did not like my idea of selling cotton wreaths. So apparently if you buy a cotton wreath from a farm stand somewhere in South Carolina, they're breaking the law apparently. Um, so I, <laughs> I have to find some way to be fully above board to sell a cotton wreath. I have to somehow sterilize the seeds without disrupting the bull. Microwaves apparently work very well thus far in testing. Um, um, I, I wanna get someone to do some technical analysis of the existing fiber characteristics. Like I, one of the, People I partnered with was supposed to be getting me some of that, but they haven't replied to any of my emails in three years. Um, um, I want to improve the cotton gin. That one that I'm currently using is a prototype and I just haven't gotten around to making improvements. I have to go buy a lathe. Um, I had a guy make me some, some actual rollers for it. He didn't listen to any of my specifications and he charged me as much as it would have cost for me to buy a hobby lathe. So that just kind of soured me on the whole thing. Um, um, can mechanical harvest ever become feasible with this crop? Um, there needs to be a more rigorous genetic study done. I, there's some, another company I'm partnering with that's supposed to get me like kind of like a complete genetic assay of a bunch of different cotton strains at some point. And my only caveat was, with them was, you can, have, you can have some of my seeds, you just gotta send me the, the results if you publish them. Um, so hopefully that'll come through at some point, maybe, fingers crossed. And what are blue naps? There's just, some of the cotton just is blue for some reason. And I don't know why, and it bothers me, and it keeps me up at night. And I want to know why, but it's just seafoam green blue cotton fibers that just come out of these immature seeds that don't quite form. And they're in like 25% of the bowls. It's strange. And no one has mentioned that anywhere that I'm aware of. It's probably those. Um, so final takeaways, Sea Island cotton is extinct no more. It's being grown on both Edisto Island and James Island. It's integral to the interpretation of our low country history and its cultivation comes with a unique host of challenges and just some preemptive parting answers. This is not a business venture and you can't pay me to grow cotton. I don't have enough time to fix the gin as it is and I don't own a tractor and I don't own any land and so I, I can't, I'm sorry. Um, and also because of the bull weevil quarantine, I can't sell or distribute seeds. There's, there are specific legal pathways in order to become a distributor of cotton seeds. I don't have time for that and nor do I know how to do them. Um, but this is public property. It's owned by the USDA. You can just apparently request it and they'll ship it to your house, apparently. So, you know. And with that, I know I went well over, but <laughs> questions? Well, they had a really good method for controlling deer back then, and that's that they killed them all. No. <laughs> so if you didn't know, we actually nearly ex extirpated white-tailed deer from South Carolina, um, which with as common as those hoofed rats are nowadays, you wouldn't imagine. Um, but so there was not a problem with deer control on Edisto Island because there probably weren't any deer on Edisto Island, which it works apparently. <laughs> There's no hunting season in every oh, yeah. There's no hunting season here, yeah, so that also played a big role. <laughs> um, in addition to that, Porsche had, um, he had access to a lot of records. I haven't gone into all, he's, the, the, um, the literature cited on the end of his book is like that thick. So he's got a lot of records cited in there and I have not yet had the time to dig into all of his primary sources. Um, but I followed what he did have in there, which is assembled from a lot of like notebooks and historical writings and that kind of stuff as best as I could. 
Yes. Are you producing more and more seeds so that there is a net gain of the number of seeds in existence, and it's yeah. not just like 25 from the freezer? And, and well, I, I don't know how much the USDA keeps in storage, but it, it's apparently a significant amount, and they only re they refresh it once every 10 years or until too many people order seeds and they have to get more of them. But I produce about 50x as many seeds as I plant every year, and that's just and that's factoring in the fact that I'm losing probably 50% of my seeds to bull rot. So it's probably you put 200 seeds in the ground, you get about 20,000 out. Um, so are you, are you freezing them, or do they? Have I, I'm not freezing them. I have actually been experimenting with the shelf life. I've been using the same seeds from 2020 that I grew at King's Market for the last three years now, and I have not seen any substantial degradation in germination rate. It has been steadily declining, but by like 5% a year, it was like 95%, then it was 90%, now it's 85%, which in the grand scheme of things. So it seems that the 10 year mark that the USDA is using is probably fairly good. These are large seeds, so they're susceptible to dehydration more so than small seeds, um, but they apparently have a really good shelf life. Um, and I have not, um, another thing I need to experiment is with acid dip, um, because I have to like do this with every single seed to get all the lint off of it, because otherwise the lint kind of acts like a spider's web and traps the seed in it. Um, and commercially, they dip the cotton seed in sulfuric acid, and they dip it in baking soda and then rinse it, and that just dissolves all the fiber off of them. And so that could also improve germination rate significantly, because I don't know how much of that is actually the fiber interfering with germination. Um, Chris? Two questions. Uh, is it, is, are the plants primarily like bee pollinated? Just um, bees love them. Um, that's what bumblebees is what I see in there mostly. A lot of American bumblebees, a lot of Easterns and some Southern Plains as well. Um, butterflies somehow manage to fit into the flower somehow. Like skippers or? I've seen a sleepy orange just cram its way in there before. <laughs> I've got a, that, probably that first photo is the one with the sleepy orange. That's just, I'm, I'm not gonna go all the back to the other 49, but I think the title photo you can see the sleepy orange jammed in that butter in there, but um, pollinators love them. Um, so that was that was a, a nice surprise. Next question would be: uh, you're you were talking about adding parasitoid wasp. Mm -hmm. um, you ever thought about just the simpler means of just putting like an insect house around it and just um, seeing if that's you know rather than ordering them, maybe you could attract. Some I them. tried doing trap crops one year, and deer. Um, so that didn't work. Um, I have the, actually, this sort of garden is embedded within a wildflower meadow okay. to a degree. It's, it's, a, it's a field where, the, where it is, but actually there's about 15 acres of undisturbed wildflower meadow that have been mating on the adjacent property, as well as a pollinator garden with a bee motel. Um, but it's, um, I, haven't, I haven't tried it directly yet, um, but what I have found is that the more grass I leave around it, the more stink bugs I have. Right. So it's a balancing act of, can I get enough functional habitat in place around it to outpace the increase in the stink bug population I get from having anything next to it? So at this rate, I've just been scalping it. <laughs> if you, um, ever it's helped by, that, by about that much. If you ever make your way out to the Coastal Discovery Museum, mm -hmm. they have an awesome insect house that does a really good job of recruiting uh, solitary wasps and stuff like that. And awesome. it. They use like bamboo shoots and stuff like that. And it's really well done, but maybe, awesome. maybe could help. Well, I might, I might just move the bee motel from the pollinator garden over to. There you go. Yeah, so, yes, sir. Um, one of the slides you said, uh, uh, see on John, perfected on John Allen, that's still on. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And what I mean by that is it was a better cultivar versus a better production technique for both? Um, the, I meant that from a um, genetic standpoint. So, kind of, it. From about the, the, the late 1780s to early 1790s, um, it was really, there were several people trying to develop something, and the thing that was eventually developed became Sea Island cotton. Um, and in that period, it was being grown in a lot of different places in the Low Country. And there was, it's, Porsche tied it to one planting in Georgia that he kind of pinned as his most probable origin for it. But I know from, actually, I think it's my, my great, 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 great grandfather is actually mentioned in the book as working with Sea Island Cotton in 1792 in Young's Island. 
So it had spread from Georgia to like all of the Charleston region by the early 1790s. And a lot of what Porsche goes over in his book is talking about um, oh, uh, Kinsey Ashburton II was really kind of the head pioneer on John's Island developing the strain. But then we also know that kind of the most prodigious and most acclaimed cottons came from Edisto Island in the following year. So it was kind of the spearhead of the development of it as a crop for the most part took place on Giant's Island. It kind of started in Georgia, spread into kind of the lower, or into the Charleston area low country, kind of coalesced into the, the most work being done on John's Island and then was kind of perfected from there on John's Island and Edisto Island after the fact. It was, it was distributed, but you had all these planters developing their own specific trade and trying to steal other people's seeds and all this stuff going on at the same time. A lot of corporate espionage, if you will. Did they have um, stink bugs? <laughs> They probably did. I don't know how the, the one stink bug I had up there, the, um, wherever that stinking horrid hell spawn is. Um, um, I forget where he was. Was he 2019? He was 2019. But anyway, uh, the green stink bug, I don't know whether that one is native to South Carolina or not. I think it's native, maybe native to the Gulf Coast or something. Um, it's hard to track nowadays whether or not, to what extent they had what specific agricultural pests because they've been moved around so much in the last century. Um, I'm sure they had stink bugs, um, but it was something that, you know, Porsche never mentioned. He never mentioned stink bugs, he never mentioned deer. I kind of, all the deer were dead, and I don't know whether they had stink bugs. Well, um, you were saying that the grass was a, is a direct implication or like a direct factor to the stink bugs? The stink bugs, they don't really like, it's, they like having another place. Thank you. Good job. Thank you all for coming. They like having a um, someplace else to kind of go to bed, if you will. Sure. They don't really like to stay on their plant because, you know, that parasitoid wasps hone in on them. So if they stay in one place, they're more likely to get parasitized. So they move around throughout the day and they move from one plant to another as they suck the life out of it. They move to a nice, fresh plant. Um, so it's, you know, the more, so if you have a lot of dense vegetation around it, they have a place they can go other than your crop which is a good thing because if you have trap crops, you can get them out of that and then you can nuke the trap crops and then get rid of the stink bugs or, or spray the trap crops without spraying your, your actual crops that you want the beneficial insects on and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's just kind of a balancing act. I don't have the time to manage the trap crops and do full integrated pest management and that kind of stuff. So I just mow the grass to oblivion. Well, and well the, way, the reason I ask is, I mean, back then when they were doing this, it was acres and acres and acres, oh, yeah. not a 25 well, by 25, yeah. right? Well, that was the other thing is it was, I lose a lot just due to exposure, just because I have a, a 25 by 50 foot plot. You know, back then they had, you know, a 25 by 50 acre plot. <laughs> So it was, you didn't have, so you, you didn't have a full ecology going on. They probably didn't have a lot of pollinators and that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, you get these hyper dense concentrations of weeds. But if, if those pests and stuff weren't introduced to that system beforehand, then they weren't able to establish. So it's, that, that's something I've racked my brain on a lot is how much of what I'm dealing with today is just a result of interstate commerce and invasive species. And how much of it were they actually dealing with directly? And I haven't dug haven't gone through and read through all the agricultural bulletins and stuff. Because I've, I've read through a lot of those where you, where you can just read about somebody just complaining about the most asinine thing in there. And it's, it's reassuring to see that they were you know, dealing with some other weird, obscure agricultural issue. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I know they didn't have nuts edge back then, which, or finger grass, which I really wish I didn't. <laughs> yes, sir. I understand that in rice culture, Africans were slaves were imported who knew about rice culture from Africa. Mm -hmm. Was there any similar um, expertise gleaned from slaves who worked in Africa in growing cotton, or is that um, totally unrelated? From a you know the production of the actual fiber and stuff, I don't believe there are any cottons native to Africa. There's Asiatic cottons and there's um, South American cottons as well. Um, don't quote me on that, but I don't think there are any native to Africa, so they probably wouldn't have had any firsthand experience dealing with the actual textiles and the processing specific to a cotton. Additionally, the long staple was so different than the upland cotton as well that that was its own thing. But okra is very similar ecologically. 
um, to cotton. So actually, the just raw cultivation of the plant was probably very similar to okra, except cotton was pickier. Um, so that probably would have translated well. I, I used a lot of what I knew about growing okra in my garden when I applied it to these plants. And okra is native to Africa, so that's that. That would probably have definitely had some carryover. Um, and the two are both uh, members of the mallow family, so they're not closely related, but they're that's why they look so similar. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.